what impact do you feel all of these new startups and other technology companies that are investing and getting involved in virtual reality will have on taking this concept of VR beyond just the talking stage to actual mass market mainstream penetration? I think that remains to be seen. I mean, there's a lot of players in this industry who are doing things in very different ways, and a lot of innovation is happening, and other people are not innovating as much. But you know, the more people that are in this industry, I think the more aware the public will become of it, and the better that can be for all of us. When you look at how quickly things have evolved since you guys first announced to where we are here at GDC, how close are we to a reality of getting these things into homes and being as commonplace as a PS4 or an Xbox One is today? We're a long way away from that. I mean, they have a pretty big head start, a couple million units and a you know, long, many, many months. But in general, we are feeling really good because for the past year, we've been researching and developing what consumer virtual reality needs to be. What does it look like? What do the specs need to be to be a minimum viable experience? And our DK2 is not that minimum viable consumer experience. It's getting very close, has many of the same core components, but we the good news is that we know what we do need to ship now, and we're in the stage where we're finalizing components, we know what components we need, we know when we need to manufacture this thing. Um, so we're getting really close. We're basically, we're not in the development and feature creep stage, we're in the make this thing and get it to people stage. Once once this thing is out there, how, how do you see the curve in terms of going from a couple people, the early investors and backers have it, to becoming a much more gamers, this is how they game. I think that it's going to happen kind of naturally. I think that gamers have always wanted to be in virtual environments. There's a reason virtual reality has been so entrenched in, in pop culture for so long. It's because people have always wanted. This isn't a product where you have to sell people on what it can do. They know what it can do. Um, once it's available to the public and to gamers, I think they're going to latch onto it very quickly. Do you still get the sense from talking to whether it's developers or people that there's still that sense that in the past there's been a lot of talk about this at different points over history and yet people always felt like it never lived up to the hype. Yeah, sure, but I mean it wasn't a matter of people trying hard enough for content or anything else, it was a technology problem. No matter how hard they tried, no matter how good the content had been, the technology wasn't even close to there. And if the technology's there, of course it couldn't live up to the hype. The funny thing is in the 80s and 90s, the people who were more excited about virtual reality were the ones who hadn't actually tried virtual reality. Uh, and I think that that's reversing now. I think that many people have kind of written it off as, oh, you know, it's not a real thing. People who try it are the ones who are most excited about it now. And I think that's really telling of its state. What influence has John Carmack had on the new SDK that you're showcasing here? A lot. Like how, how is he helping you guys with, because uh, he's a big fan of VR from way back when he was at it. He's been helping us with a lot of things, from mobile to the PC side to the SDK. He's been a really valuable part of the team and we're super thrilled that he joined. You mentioned mobile. What, what opportunities do you see in the mobile space when it comes to virtual reality, especially where we've seen a lot of experimentation with augmented reality already on mobile devices? So, I think that in the far future, this is all going to be running off mobile chipsets. It's going to be headsets with built-in processing power that aren't tied via any kind of connection to an outside box or service or connection. Um, but we're a long way away from mobile chipsets being nearly as powerful as you know the computers we have today. Right now, we do have experiences that run on mobile, and that's one of the things Carmack's been working on. You know, looking at our long-term vision for what we're doing. Um, you can run things like VR, like a virtual reality movie theater or basic games on mobile platforms of today. It's all about scaling the fidelity and scale of the experience. Um, and that's going to improve more and more and more over time. And eventually AR and VR are going to converge. They're trying to solve a lot of the same problems. And tech, the same technology solves many of those problems. But it's going to be many years before AR is a solved problem. It's, it, it's much harder than VR. Do you see a future at some point, even if it's 20 years from now, where everything is VR and the whole concept of a screen goes away? I don't even know if that's 20 years away. I think it could be closer. But maybe within a decade? I don't think the concept of a screen will go away within a decade, but I do think it'll be greatly reduced. I mean, if right now VR has limitations like resolution uh, compared to you know much smaller, you know much much smaller fields of view display. But once the resolution of VR goes up to where it's either equivalent to that or I think even to where the human eye is, there's no benefit to having a real screen when you have something that is taking much less raw materials, easier to transport, easy to take with you, and it can simulate a hundred multiple screens all around you. 
that's a huge advantage, and I, I can't see mainstream screens having nearly the foothold that they have today if that comes to pass.